Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jenna Flanagan. The Trumps, the Kushners, and the rise of two power-hungry American dynasties. That's the subject of a fascinating new book from Andrea Bernstein, American Oligarchs. The Kushners, the Trumps, and the marriage of money and power uncovers how both families rose from humble immigrant roots to the pinnacle of power and influence. It traces how two families harnessed New York and New Jersey politics to gain valuable tax breaks and built their wealth on federal programs designed to help the middle class, often to the exclusion of blacks and other minorities. And it brings the story to the modern age when the two families, now joined by marriage, would bring those same practices to consolidate their power on a global scale. Joining us now is award-winning investigative journalist Andrea Bernstein, who for decades has been covering the confluence of money, power, and corruption in the worlds of business and politics. She's also the co-host of WNYC ProPublica podcast, Trump, Inc. Andrea, welcome to Metro Focus. It's really great to be here with you. Oh, my God, it's so great. This book is intense, to put it mildly. <laughs> so first, I just want to start because this seems to be the administration that has spawned a million books. So what was it about this particular narrative that you found to be the most unique? So what I wanted to do was to tell not just the story of what's happening now and what's happening in the White House, but mm. to tell the whole multi-generational saga of these two families and how they came together. But it's also a story about our democracy and the choices that we have made as a nation or not made that have led to an increased influence of wealth in our modern politics. Much more, every day, we see more influence than we did the day before. And even for me, I mean, I've covered corruption, particularly in New York and New Jersey, for a quarter century. And I have never seen anything like what is going on now. So what I wanted to tell was <laughs> these three strands braided together, the two families plus us and mm -hmm. our democracy and the choices we've made and perhaps different choices that we could make in the future to correct for some of these trends. Well, also I want to ask about the use of the word oligarchs, because that tends to make, I think, most people think of uh, Russia and some of the political corruption that we see there. Why choose that word in the title for your book? So it's really interesting, because when I came up with the title, I wasn't, I didn't know about all of the Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs that we were going to learn about <laughs> subsequently through the Mueller report, through the Ukraine investigation. But what I did understand fundamentally is that in our own society, there is such a greater influence by wealthy people on government. So let me backtrack a moment. I mm -hmm. think one of the aha moments for me when I was writing the book was during Paul Manafort's trial. And there was a witness that was put on the stand who was a consultant that worked with Paul Manafort in support of the corrupt Ukrainian strongman president. And they kept him in power for 10 years. And this witness was asked, do you know who paid you? And he said, oh, yes, very rich people. They call them oligarchs. And to me, this was such an aha moment because I thought to myself, there's no super PAC, there's no campaign finance committee. The oligarchs just pay for the consultants to get the candidates they want with the understanding that those candidates will then enable them to keep getting richer and richer. And it becomes a spiral. So they get richer, they can support the candidate they like more. Mm -hmm. And that's what is happening in Ukraine. Now, we are not there yet. We still have a system of disclosures. We still have a democracy. But we are moving towards that. And one of the big reasons we're moving towards that is Donald Trump, both because of the ways he behaved as a businessman and the way he behaved as has been behaving as president. So as a businessman in New York, he and I didn't even realize this when I started writing, but he really acted in an oligarchic way. He gave so much money to local elected officials mm -hmm. and expected something in return. I mean, so I've called many, many, many public officials over the years. And I've said, do you know why so-and-so gave you a donation? And it's always like, well, they support my politics or et cetera. With Donald Trump, when I would call people, when they were being honest, and I would say, do you know why Donald Trump gave this to you? And they would be, oh, yes. I know because he told me. He called me up screaming at me. And he was, I gave you a 
contribution? Where's my permit? Where's my variance? Where's my tax break? Etc. So he had an extremely transactional view of politics, even in a world where everybody in the real estate industry understands that you need to contribute to people because they control your business. Donald Trump and his father before him were outliers. So they had this same practice of being wealthy people who would contribute to government officials, would get benefits in return. One of the tax breaks he got for his earliest business deals, I just went and checked with the New York City Department of Finance, it was worth $400 million in total. $400 It was million. $400 million. Now, he sold the property. This was the what is now the Grand Hyatt Hotel. He no longer owns it. Okay. But he negotiated a deal for a 40-year tax break that the city is still paying. So he practiced this system of giving a lot of money to the politicians, expecting to get something back, and then giving them more. And that is the oligarchic model and the American oligarchic model that he has brought with him to the White House. So in the White oh. House, he has telegraphed to mm -hmm. very wealthy people, I am going to treat you the way I expected to be treated as a businessman. And he does this every day. He does it openly. People who patronize much. his hotels, Great his honor. golf courses, not to mention doing the old-fashioned, just giving to his campaign, mm -hmm. get preferential treatment. We see it. We hear it. There are tapes. He tweets it out. If he doesn't like you, he will say that you should be investigated by the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. And that, too, is oligarchic behavior. So the title, even more than I knew when I chose it when I started this book project two years ago, I think has unfortunately borne out. Well, one of the things that I also thought was so interesting is that uh, your book, not only does it not pull any punches, it doesn't really let anyone off the hook. And what I think so many people might also at this point associate with the president is, well, he's, you know, he's part of the uh, problem with the GOP, et cetera. And actually, no, the whole time he was donating and expecting these favors from both parties. Right. And as a matter of fact, I mean, he started his career by essentially controlling the Brooklyn Democratic bosses. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the major ways the Trump family real estate business was built, was by getting the abatements, the favors, the federal loan packages, which were often controlled by people who were controlled by the party. So for him, it was not only it was not only not Republican, but it was actually Democrat for, for many, many years. And it is a certainly this sort of overall pattern of contributions is something that this country is dealing with the troubling consequences of. We just passed the 10th anniversary of the Citizens United Court decision. And that was the decision that allowed unlimited basically corporate yeah. contributions into campaigns. And we're living with the effects of that. And, and Donald Trump benefited from that, which was something, I mean, that court decision was very consciously funded by the court case by very wealthy families in America. So the DeVos family, the Prince family, this is related to Betsy DeVos, mm -hmm. the education secretary. So they wanted to get rid of campaign finance regulation, and they supported this lawsuit, and they won. They broke the system along the way. I mean, one of their scenes in the book, I talk about being in Ohio in 2010, mm, right yes. after the court decision. <laughs> and there are so many ads, and the ads say things like uh, they have pictures of prison bars, they have pictures of bags of cash, they say Washington is terrible, your government officials are crooks. Mm -hmm. And it was 24-7. It was a noticeably big boost in television airtime from previous campaigns I'd covered. Well, if you're a rational person and you live in a swing state and all you hear is all the, the time is, terrible, yeah. is the government is stealing from you, and then Donald Trump comes in and says, the government's stealing from you, I'm going to fix it. That was an acknowledgment that he made very good use of. Now, of course, he didn't fix it. He broke it beyond recognition. But he was able to play upon the system that had been broken by a lot of people that came before him. Of course. Yeah. And without getting too much further into that, I do want to talk, though, about the stories of both of these families, because mm. these are two immigrant families, yeah. um, which juxtaposed to some of the policies from the administration makes it incredibly ironic. But tell me a little bit about, let's start with the Trumps and then, of course, the Kushners, which is an incredibly harrowing story. Right. So one of the, I mean, Donald Trump's grandfather, Friedrich mm. Trump, immigrated in 1885, which was 
a time like our own. It was the Gilded Age, so big disparities in wealth. And not just, it wasn't just that people were wealthy, they wanted everyone to know it. So there was a <laughs> restaurant in Manhattan, Delmonico's, where there was an artificial lake and there were swans swimming around and people had actual gold toilets in their homes. The big really? mansions that were built up and down the Hudson Valley were Gilded yeah. Age mansions. I mean, people were wealthy mm -hmm. and they wanted the world to know it. But a difference between that time and our own time was that you could still change your social class. So that's what Friedrich Trump did. He arrived in New York, he worked here for a little bit as a barber, but then he very quickly goes west and he gets into the hospitality business, first in Seattle and then in the Yukon. And during the last North American gold rush, he builds a series of restaurants in the Yukon, which are catering to the appetites of the prospectors for food and liquor and access to sex. And he situates his restaurants in places where there'll be a lot of foot traffic, a lot of people coming through. He makes money. Many people in the gold rush lose money. He comes back to New York and he invests in real estate in Queens, right at the time that the government is getting ready to build a bridge to Queens. So Queens, which had been fairly cut off from Manhattan at that time, you had to come through Brooklyn or you had to come by boat, is suddenly about to become much more accessible, which means that land is going to become much more valuable. And that really becomes the template for the Trump family business because they understand that it's not just the land, it's the way the government is going to do things to enhance the value of the land uh -huh. that is important. And then they begin the cycle, first mostly with Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump, and then Donald Trump of donations and benefits and tax benefits. I mean, one of the stories I tell in the book is about how Trump Tower, which was at the... So there's a term in real estate called Tiffany location, which means the best location in a city. Yeah. So Trump Tower was built at the actual location of Tiffany's. <laughs> and yet, Donald Trump was able to argue a court case that he was entitled to tens of millions of dollars in tax breaks that were designed for affordable housing. So that was the Trump family business model, and that's how their business developed. Now, when Trump passed the Jobs Act, the, jobs, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, it, because it allowed so much more accumulation of wealth by the very wealthy, mm -hmm. and in particular by corporations, what it meant was that the social elasticity that his grandfather had benefited from, that Friedrich Trump had benefited from, was available to fewer and fewer people. So it's harder to change your class now than it was, than it was during when, the Gilded Age. Right, when Friedrich Trump arrived. That is amazing. Tell me a little bit about uh, the Kushners. So the Kushner family immigrated to New York at a different time in our history. They, Jared Kushner's grandparents, were from northeast Poland, an area that was invaded first by the Soviet Union, then by the Nazis. And there was a, I mean, one of the things that's most tragic in the book is, one of the reasons I know this story is because there were a series of testimonies left by the survivors, including by Jared Kushner's grandmother. And she tells the story of living in Poland as a teenager, and they heard stories about the Nazis coming in and killing people in southern Poland, but they just didn't believe it. And then the Nazis marched into their town, and at first it seemed okay. There were some people that were murdered, but they told themselves, well, maybe it was because they were insurgents or they were doing something wrong. But then thousands and then tens of thousands of people were murdered, and there are only a few hundred of them left. So what they decide to do is they take bits of wood, spoons, anything they can smuggle past the Nazi guards, and they dig a tunnel out underneath the barbed wire. They, it takes them three months. They put the bags of dirt in the walls so the Nazis will not know what they're doing. And then on a rainy September night, they crawl out through a two-foot-wide tunnel, some 300 feet. Many of them escape to the forest where there's a band of Jewish partisans, and they basically stay there through the war. I mean, they live in these semi-underground structures through a brutal Polish winter. Jared, Kushner's grandmother, Ray Kushner, her father and sister are the members of the family that make it. Her brother was killed, her mother was killed, her sister was killed by the Nazis. They go back to their town and it's a wasteland. So they want to get out. They're now occupied still by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union doesn't want them to leave. So they pose as Greeks and they board a train. They get as far as Budapest. That's where Jared Kushner's grandmother, Ray Kushner, meets up with Yussel Berkowitz, a young man that she had known from before the war. And they marry. 
And they continue their journey south. They sneak around border guards. They walk across borders illegally. They get to a refugee camp in Italy. They're stateless. They have no documents. No one wants to take them in. Not South Africa, not Australia, not the UK, not the US. And this is, we've just passed the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. So mm -hmm. by this time, Americans knew the experience that the Jews had had in Europe, but there were still immigration quotas. So they hit on an idea that Jared Kushner's grandfather, Yussel Berkowitz, is going to pose as his father-in-law's son, as Ray Kushner's father's son. He changes his name to Joe Kushner, and they get papers. They are able to immigrate, and they take a two-week bo uh, boat ride, and they arrive in New York with $2 in their pockets. They're taken in by the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and they're helped to get on their feet. And Joe Kushner worked as a carpenter. He got jobs. He got jobs as a carpenter. And then he becomes a builder. He buys a plot of land. And it's a great time to be a builder in New Jersey, because after the war, all this federal money mm -hmm. is going into loan programs. It's going into building roads so you can get to suburban housing. And from $2 in his pocket, he becomes a millionaire many times over by the time he dies mm -hmm. in the 1980s. And I think that's incredibly uh, important to point out because, of course, a lot of these federal programs, as I sort of alluded to in the in intro, were intentionally excluding uh, definitely African Americans Absolutely. and other minorities as well. So that was something else that they were able to, right. whether even intentionally right. or not, to help build on. Um, but one of the things I find so interesting is that, at least now when we hear immigrant narratives, we tend to hear stories of either people in communities or families wanting to bring others along and to help. And I'm wondering, what from your research for this book did you get to see about what what were the values that were passed down? Basically, how did we get to the right. characters that we know today? Well, it's really complicated with the Holocaust story because mm -hmm. there's a lot of lessons to be learned. So um, I think a lesson that people would assume would be learned, that you would be warm and welcoming to refugees such as yourself. We're in an administration where not only are immigrants being kept out, but even refugee resettlement is at modern historic lows. Mm -hmm. But there's another strain that comes from people who survive the Holocaust, which is a sense of, I must protect myself and my family at all costs. And also, something we see a lot in both Jared Kushner and his father, Charlie Kushner, is a sense rules are for other people. Now, if you were living under the Nazis, you were constantly having to defy the authorities just to live. But that is another lesson mm -hmm. that has tracked through the through the generations. Now, I want to say that um, you know these are, I mean, Joe and Ray Kushner had four children. There was a split in the family, and some of Jared Kushner's cousins have made different choices in their lives. So, one of the things I really wanted to point out in the book is that while these families are emblematic, they're not typical. And they made choices. And one of the things I wanted to do in American Oligarchs was to trace the choices that these specific families made. Mm -hmm. Because if one thinks those are not the correct choices, and I show where the choices were made, there's a sense of, OK, well, there is power in understanding what happened here. Andrea, thank you so much thank for you. a great book, for a fabulous podcast. and. Um, yeah, I really cannot emphasize enough how much of a fascinating read and a better understanding it gave me of these two families. Thank you so much. It's great to speak with you.